So welcome to Mastering Open Source, Balancing the Code Supply Chain and IP Protection. So today we're gonna to look at how to open source your code while safeguarding your company's most valuable assets, its intellectual property. So I'm just gonna start with a, a little story and then I'll pass it over to Florence who then will also continue that story. So about seven years ago, um, I was hired by Uni Unity Technologies, which is a game engine, to be their first legal counsel to support the R&D department, which was building the game engine um, that had been built over a period of 10 years. So it was a giant um, code base and also a huge task. Uh, I believe there was somewhere between 700 and 800 engineers and developers that I was supporting as the sole legal counsel when I joined. And when I joined, we had a whole range of understanding um, from developers, right? Some developers who knew open source licensing better than I did, um, had it memorized. And, um, you know, sometimes I'd have to check my notes to make sure. So we had experts and then we had, you know, junior developers who really didn't understand, uh, have a good grasp of even licensing, let, al let alone open source licensing. Um, and so... I was in charge of making sure that when we incorporated open source, we then properly attributed it and that we also complied with the open source license terms. And Unity had had a tool that they were using, but unfortunately it was broken. So then I, I came in and had to work with them to figure out how we could do this in a way that didn't impede their velocity, right? If there's one legal counsel and 800 engineers, uh, that's a lot of work <laughs> for me. And how do we incorporate and use those limited legal resources in a way that blends seamlessly with the development and engineering practices? So the idea was looking at like, how do I, as you know, a legal counsel and legal team of one, work with all of these teams to make sure that I'm protecting the company and we're doing the right things, but I'm doing it in a way that you know is incorporated into their development practices. I don't want them to force them to come to me. I want to, to go to them and just have it be another step in processes that they're already doing so they hardly even notice, right, that... Um, they're working with legal, it just becomes second nature. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, our journey and what we learned working together um, as engineering and legal partners in open sourcing uh, different parts of the product. So I will hand it over from here. Uh, so thank you, Laura. Uh, as Laura said, we worked together uh, several years ago uh, at Unity, the most uh, used game engine in the world. And at that point, Unity was going through a very big shift that basically the code base had become extremely huge. And it was difficult to build and um, release the engine. And also parts of the engine were open source, but a lot of it was not open source. And Unity had um, a plan to open source more but also to make it more flexible for the teams to follow their own release schedule and also uh, build more partnerships outside of Unity with uh, partners and uh, other companies. So it, it, was, it was a period of huge growth for the company. I joined six years ago, so shortly after Laura. It was a period of huge growth, but also very big shift uh, towards how we were uh, considering intellectual property and uh, software licensing, since uh, the, the core product of Unity is the game engine, it's a software product. So that's basically all the wealth of, uh, of the company. And um, at Unity, I was working as a software engineer in infrastructure, so more from the build and release side, and uh, Laura as a legal counsel, and we were both members of a working group of a few people who were there to define how we were going to handle this shift to releasing uh, several software packages instead of just one big engine and how we were moving towards more open sourcing and making it both um, seamless for the developers, but also safe for the company. We, we wanted to protect the company and the partners. Um, so we, we, came, uh, we, we came up with guidelines and, uh, and, and a lot of tooling too to make that possible. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so today we, we're going to cover the benefits of open source, why you might consider open source licensing. Um, and there are a lot of interesting ones, especially as we're moving more and more towards the adoption um, of artificial intelligence. We're going to look at IP protection challenges. So they're understanding licensing a little bit better and why what is called copy left licenses pose such a problem for uh, commercial enterprises and organizations. Then we'll look at how you can navigate the code supply chain, right? That's an um, issue where some teams uh, will get stuck. And so, you know, what are some good uh, or best practices and strategies to think of around there? And then we'll talk about how you can have effective collaboration with the legal team because it really is a partnership and then we'll wrap up sort of with our key learnings and how you know legal teams engineering and development teams can really partner to supercharge both of their operations and really become a valuable asset to the company by partnering together so first uh, the benefits of open source why do we want to move uh, towards more open source. Um, I think I don't need to introduce it for this audience, but we'll still uh, go over uh, some of the in interesting points from an enterprise point of view, because open sourcing for a university or for um, a single person who is uh, developing uh, as a hobby is very different from open sourcing as a company, uh, something that already exists and that you're also trying to monetize. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the main uh, interests of open sourcing is to market the company as a technology leader. Basically, you're putting your code out there. You're showcasing how good you are. You're showcasing that you're following best practices. Uh, you're showcasing that you're doing uh, R&D, doing things that are innovative, that are well done, and that uh, can ma market you as technically excellent. It's also a way to reassure your partners and your customers about the quality of what you're delivering. So your enterprise software, it, it's it's out there. You, you, you can go through it, you can audit it. And some partners or customers are absolutely going to do it because the code is available. So they are going to either audit it themselves or they are going to pay external companies to audit the code. And they are going to be reassured about some of the um, uh, characteristics of this code, but they are also maybe going to come back to you with problems and concerns that they want fixed. It's a way to go into business with uh, some types of partners and uh, administrations that require a very high level of security because now they can audit your code and they can be reassured about what they are going to run and pay for. It's also a way to drive adoption. Basically, other people are going to be aware of your project and your code and um, they since it's available they are going to build on top of it so a whole ecosystem is going to form around your code once it's open sourced if you're if you're lucky because that's the aim and um, basically they are going to extend it they are going to also maybe release tools that allow to integrate your your tool and um, your libraries with other software or in other contexts so it's basically extending what you're providing for free you're not paying for that. Other people are actually going to release it. Next, you're also going to benefit from external contributions. So basically, as I said, if you have partners or customers who are auditing your code and coming back with problems, they are going to open bug, bug reports or they are going to open uh, pull requests with fixes. Sometimes they might even go as far as creating new features for your software and um, integration tools, as I said before. So all this, you get for free. Your your code is there, it's available, and people can now um, c communicate and extend it. It's also a way to attract talent. Uh, top talent in IT is rare and valuable, and a lot of this top talent is in the open source community. The, the, these are people who want their work to be um, showcased. They, they want their work to be public, Open sourcing is close to the heart of many people who work as developers or uh, adjacent uh, software 
uh, roles. And um, if you give them the opportunity to develop on an open source product, it means that all the, the code that they are contributing to your product is going to be public. It's something that is really a way to attract some of these top talents. So it facilitates recruiting. And uh, last but not least, it makes onboarding so much easier because when you recruit people who have already gone through uh, your products, sometimes they even worked on it. They, they have audited it because they were working for a company that wanted an audit on your code or they have reported problems. They, they may, may even have gone as far as developing a, a small feature. You don't need to completely onboard them. They have already done it. They already know what they are signing up for and they know what your code base is like. So it really kickstarts the onboarding process in your company. Next slide, please. Yeah. Perfect. Um, thanks for that. And now we'll talk about some of the challenges because those were some great um, benefits that you can get from open sourcing. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll sort of set the scene. I like to always start at the very beginning to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, so when we're talking about open source licensing, we are referring to a bundle of rights that come with that. And that would be the ability to use, modify, integrate, and distribute the open source software. There are generally two types of open source software. The first is the permissive type, right? That's going to pretty much allow you to do anything. So freely use, modify, integrate, and distribute the software in your products uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, for a lot of these licenses, really, the main requirement is just attribution, that you're acknowledging that you've uh, used this product and you're replicating the, the license um, attribution in your product. These the open source uh, licenses that are permissive that most companies generally will accept without issue, right, is MIT, Apache 2.0, and BSD 2 and 3. And then we get to the uh, trickier open source uh, software licenses, which also are referred to as copy left licenses. These are ones that place restrictions and obligations on the people that use the software. Um, the one that really causes the biggest issues would be that if you are incorporating the product or modifying the open source software into your product, you then have an obligation to disclose all of your source code that relates to either using that product and or modifying it. And so some of the more restrictive open source licenses are GPL3 and 2 and the LGPLs. So this is to sort of give you an idea about where, uh, you know, these different licenses fall. So if we're going from top to bottom, from the bottom, it is uh, more restrictive to less restrictive. Um, and then if we're going, uh, we're going to go more from org specific to generic. So if we start um, in the very bottom left-hand corner, you're going to see the there's closed open source. So that would be the code that you are developing, you know, in-house proprietary that is going to be specific to your company, your product, what you're building. You normally don't have plans to open source this. And so this is org specific and is going to be very permissive because it's your code that you're building. And then we move up to right copy left which is going to be less permissive. And then if we move over to very ge generic and less permissive, that's where we're gonna get into the you know, G, um, GPLs and LGPLs. Uh, and as mentioned, right, this is where we're running into issues if you're modifying or using them and you need to look and see um, how you're using the, the software because that will then impact you know, what you have to disclose and what obligations that you um, need to adhere to when you're using the software. And it does vary on how you're using it um, and whether or not there are libraries and you know that will be discussed later. Um, but that's why um, this is such an interesting issue and then also such a challenge because it is not just black uh, or white. It really depends how you're using the software and then the license uh, terms. So now that you know that, why should you care? Um, well, first, 
we're in an interesting place. When I would sort of do this talk, let's say six or seven years ago, we were trying to find uh, cases that would demonstrate like that there are monetary fines associated with not using open source software correctly. A lot of it um, initially would be that you're going to have reputational damage, right? If you're a software company building software and you're using someone else's software, um, not in accordance with their terms and conditions or their licenses, that's a really bad look because you obviously would want people to be using your software under the terms and conditions and licenses that you provide it. Um, but now, earlier this year, there was a French court that um, awarded uh, 900,000 euros um, for GPL violations by Orange, and who failed to comply with the source, close, source code disclosure requirement of the GPL, which um, I mentioned earlier. And there's currently a case pending in the United States where the Software Freedom Conservancy is suing Visio for again the same violation of not disclosing source code per the GPL license, and because the U.S. tends to be more litigious and there are more damages, um, might we see an even larger fine um, there? So it really is interesting to watch this. There are monetary consequences, not only just reputational consequences of not using open source correctly. Uh, now we are going to talk a bit about the code supply chain and, and how it relates to software licensing. Uh, so I think um, everyone knows here what the code supply chain is. It's, made, it's basically everything that goes into creating and distributing a software product. So all the libraries, compilers, uh, binaries you might be using, all these things that go into your final product. And you have to look at the whole chain and not just at, at the things that you yourself are developing. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, first of all, supply chain attacks, they are not a purpose. It's a means to an end. And um, your uh, third party dependencies are security risks. So when you're using library, external libraries, you're potentially setting yourself up for trouble if these are compromised or have known security issues. And uh, in a free and open source uh, software context, your supply chain is usually pretty large. Uh, because it's not just your libraries, your compilers, and all the things you immediately control. It's also all your contributors, all the people who navigate around your code and are not your employees. And you need to know them really well, and it's usually not possible. And even the people who you already have vouched for, the people who you have approved, uh, their accounts can be compromised, and you have no control over uh, how they they are uh, connecting and and and. You, their whole um, hardware uh, network, all, all the things that they use to code and contribute to your code, they are external. You have no control over this. So it means that you are now vulnerable uh, to supply chain attacks around your being open source. And next slide, please. Um, from the licensing point of view, uh, we're not going to give a security talk here. It means that you have to watch the licensing of all your dependencies and your compilers. One of the most problematic ones, and you have seen that uh, with the legal cases, is GPL, because these are viral. It means that basically the code that uh, is uh, using these libraries or dependencies uh, is going to have to be disclosed. Like it, it, it has impacts on the target code. And uh, some projects or libraries can also change licensing. It happens sometimes. It doesn't happen all the time. People usually stick to a license, but sometimes version bump and boom, you have a different license. And it's not always very loud. Uh, one of the recent cases is uh, Mono um, Tools. They used to be licensed uh, under GPL. And uh, then in 2016, the Mono project decided to license them under MIT. It can happen both ways uh, towards a more permissive or less permissive uh, license. It's something that you might miss because you're going to typically check the licensing 
licensing of a new dependency that you have, but not on a version bump. And that's where the problems happen. And it can be a huge issue that you discover later. If you are in a situation where you're in an in, in fragment, the whole world can see because you're open source. I, I don't say that it's fine to do it when you're in closed source, but Typically, if it's only your employees and they are not looking for this type of problem, you you usually have a lot of bandwidth to discover that you're an infringement and fix the issue. But if you're in an open source context, there are people who are going to actively monitor your code for these issues. There are literally foundations that monitor the code bases of big companies that are open sourcing their software just to check for these things. So now, instead of having a few months before an employee tells you, okay, I think this is not fine, you have maybe a few hours before someone knocks on your door and is like, okay, we're going to sue you. Uh, it gets uh, dangerous pretty fast. Uh, the legal risks are usually harder to assess than the security risks because we have a lot of tooling around security and also software developers have basic knowledge of software security. But legal risks are a different beast. Uh, software developers, on average, they are not interested into licensing. It, it's not something that we typically learn at university. At least, it's not something that I learned at university when I was studying uh, software development. And only a few people are really into that. And most people are going to be like, OK, whatever. I'm going to use this dependency. It looks fine. But the problem is, looks fine. Uh, and a lawyer's job is going to be, OK, it's not fine. This is actually a threat for the company. Laura's job, and she does it very well, is to say, OK, here we have a potential problem. And also, one thing that software developers are typically not aware of is that everything depends on jurisdiction. Something that is completely legal in the US might not be legal in Europe. And it goes the other way around. So it can be very messy, depending on where the different actors are um, situated. Next slide, please. So oh. uh, no, now the legal co collaboration, the, the meat of the talk. How do we collaborate between legal and uh, software development teams around uh, open source compliance? Perfect. And I'm shocked to hear that uh, programmers and developers are not interested in licensing terms. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, how can you work with legal and then how can we work together and partner and create open source compliance policies and procedures? So first, I just want to address sort of, um, I guess, a stereotype or what individuals normally think of when they think of right legal. Um, what is legal's role in product development? A lot of people think that you need to involve legal if you get a contract or a piece of paper, or at the moment of release, oh shoot, I should probably tell legal that we're releasing a product. Um, and although legal does work on contracts and we do work on product releases, right, in product development, reaching out to legal just before you want to release a product is probably not going to be a great experience for you or for the legal team. So let me let me talk a little bit more about that. When should you actually contact legal? So when I was at Unity, I helped to really work on developing what you would normally call like a product council um, function. So becoming integrated with and really partnering with the R&D and technology organizations to integrate into their processes and to figure out where should legal be involved. And initially, right, there's a lot of pu pushback and people were like, you can get involved when we want to release at the moment of release. And so it took education to help them understand that actually everyone is going to have a much better experience and the there won't be any slowdowns if we start working together really from ideation, right? So there, there doesn't have to be heavy legal involvement, but it, at least if you have some sort of process or procedure at your company, right, just involving the legal team that's going to be the legal counsel on that product from 
um, a, an early stage just to say, hey, this is what we're thinking about. Um, and that can that involves everything from right, privacy analysis, analysis to IP ownership to licensing. And so the legal counsel has an idea of what you're going, what you're thinking about and where you want to go. And then they can accompany you on that development journey. And as you build the product, right, depending again on how your company is structured and your processes are structured, then having legal come in at different points to help check it, check for licensing in and check for licensing out. And so when I say licensing in, that is when I'm referring to um, you're taking open source and bringing it into your product. So uh, most companies will generally uh, uh, approve, sort of like blanket approve MIT, Apache 2.0, and BSD uh, 3, and say, if you're using those open source licenses and software that's licensed under that to bring into our product because they are so permissive, um, you don't really need to get the legal team to, to check on that. It's not going to impact our product. We're not, it's not going to force us to share source code. So that was one way to really let the developers know, hey, here's the, the safe list. If you use these licenses, it's not going to cause a problem. We're not going to have issues. Use these as much as you want. So that's when you're licensing in. Um, so you license it in. And what I would get uh, normally from products or from packages would then be all of the content or all of the software that was licensed in. And I'd go through and look at all of the different licenses. And if I found uh, a license that I didn't know, I've never seen before, or I found a copy left license like GPL, that's then when I would flag that and then go back to the development team and say, you know, how are we using this? So for some of, um, you know, if you're using some something internally and it has copy left in there and you're not, um, you know, distributing that at all, right, that's different than if you're using a GPL in uh, your source code, which you're distributing to the end uh, user. And so those are going to have very different legal consequences. But by setting up processes and working together, we really you know, we're able to create a really nice system where the legal team, you know, did not impede velocity and we were able to do what we needed to do to get the licensing in. And then once we check the licensing in, right, we would have to then make sure that when we licensed out the product, the same licenses flow through. So then um, under the license file for the different products or packages, we would then list all of our open source uh, licenses that we had. So then we made sure we were adhering to the license, um, the license terms. So that's when I refer to licensing in and licensing out. That's what legal is checking for to make sure we're complying with terms, bringing it in. And then also when we're licensing the package back out. Um, and that happens through, you know, alpha and beta phases. And so once you get to general release, right, and you've given the legal counsel enough time to review these files, there really shouldn't be any holdup and you should be ready to go and then before generally should really be looking more at commercial terms and marketing and other um, legal risks and issues other than open source, because you've already been working with the legal counsel to take to take care of those. Um, so when you're developing a, an open source policy, I think it's really important to work hand in hand, again, integrating from a legal counsel perspective, integrating into the engineering and development workflows Right, figure out where you can fit in and where you can do, you know, the open source software and licensing check. There are various iterations depending on the teams that I was working in and the process while Unity was scaling. So, you know, we had a, uh, our own in-house tool at one point. I would be put on pull requests at another point, and then eventually we had built, you know, an automated system in Jira. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to approach this, and it really is about the legal team and um, you know the operational people working together and figuring out where is best to insert that legal review to make it as fast and painless as possible so that the intellectual property is protected. And now we'll kind of wrap up here um, with some best practices about ensuring timely and safe releases? So um, first of all, legal is not the enemy. It's one of the things that really uh, 
caused problems when uh, when Laura started uh, working at Unity is that suddenly it, it looks like there is an extra checkbox that people need to check before they are allowed to release a new product. And legal, when you contact them a few days before your release date with a, a complex uh, hairball of things uh, because you're using a ton of libraries and, 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 uh, and, and nothing has been thought from a legal perspective, they are going to say no. They, they are not going to let you release your product before they have done an assessment. So we had a few experiences with teams who were really upset that the legal department needs three weeks to go through everything and make sure that we are not breaking the, the law. Um, so a good rule of thumb is that the legal team, it's risk management. It's the same as your security team or your QA team. Involve them early, just as Laura said, because you want them to have the time to do their job properly. And uh, if you're not involving them early, then you're going to pay the price that you will have to wait. But besides that, we are actually very similar. I found that working with a lawyer was a lot like working with other engineers uh, because first of all, we are a very detail-oriented people. The legal team and the development teams usually are people who tend to look at the details, try to dig down, understand everything, ask a lot of questions. We are not people who make up things on either side. And that's really nice. It's very different from working with marketing. And it's something that I really enjoyed that we were all trying to actually understand what was going on and, and how this could work in our business. And we also have a common goal. Our common goal is for the company to be successful and the product to be great and our customers to be satisfied. It, 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 it means that we have to cover a lot of things. And the legal checks are one of these things because if we break the law and we get sued and we have to pay damages, then all this money, we're not going to have it for developing our product. If you get sued and you have to pay 1 million in damages, that's a whole development team that disappears when it comes to the budget. So as an engineer, I'm very invested in not getting sued so that I can have these extra developers to work on the actual product. I think that when you explain to people that this is what we're trying to avoid, we're trying to avoid getting sued, we're trying to avoid losing partners, we're trying to avoid losing customers, we are also trying to hire the best people. And if we have reputation damages, this is not going to happen. Then people start to listen and they understand that uh, legal is a partner and uh, not an enemy or a core to go for. So explaining the why is very important. Definitely. And I um, would like to also say, you know, that, yeah, there, there are so many similarities uh, between what we do. And one of those happens to be problem solving creatively. Um, so I really enjoyed working with engineering and development teams because once we understood each other's why, we were then able to put our heads together, right? I get to love working with really smart people to come up with creative solutions. And that might be different than working with say marketing or say the sales team that have very different motivations, right? Um, legal and engineering development teams are very much aligned in the goals of getting the product out and keeping it safe. And one of, one of the explanations besides, you know, reputational harm and financial damages also is that if you were working on a product and you've spent, you know, however many months or years or doing that, and you didn't go through the proper checks and there's GPL in there, GPL code, which then would require us to uh, you know, show show the source code. And then let's say um, it's some source code, especially if we're talking about Unity, would then have a proprietary code of third parties, right? All uh, Nintendo, Apple, right? All the different platforms that you can develop in Unity in. Um, those companies definitely don't want to open source their source code. So if you created something that would then force um the source code of third parties or partners to be disclosed, we just couldn't re release that, right? So we also wanna make sure that you can release your products that you're spending all of this time and energy in 
and we don't want to be a team that says no. Um, but we need to make sure that we work together and understanding um, the code so that we can meet that common goal of right making great products uh, for users that protect IP, not only of your company, but potentially also of uh, partner companies that are working with you that have their source code incorporated into it as well. And I think, you know, when we really sat down and understood the why from both sides, then it was easy to come up with solutions, right? Um, and creative solutions and innovate. And that's part of the, the fun of being a lawyer working with engineering and development teams is to use that, that creativity. So, you know, I think our, our last piece of advice or parting words would be, it really is a cross-functional collaboration, right? The management of open source software requires both development and engineering teams and legal to work in partnership. Legal can't do it alone. Development and engineering teams can't do it alone. It really does require both parties coming together and sharing information and working collaboratively in order for it to be successful. And I don't know, Florence, if you have any, any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, we 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 covered uh, all the things I wanted to cover, so I'm happy. Um, it's it's also going back to the supply chain. What Laura just said that we don't want to expose code from our partners, and um, if you are making the wrong decisions, it doesn't just impact you; it impacts the people who rely on you. So it can have catastrophic um, cat catastrophic consequences on your partners also. And, and even your customers in some cases. So you really want to do the, the right thing, not just for yourself, but for the whole ecosystem that you're in. Exactly. Well, thank you for having us today and please feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. We like talking about these subjects. So thank you for having us. And thanks a lot. <laughs>